Good morning, everybody. We'd like to start. All right. Welcome you again to day five of the winter school. Our um, opening lecture today is by Professor Walter Anbrust, and the title is Patterns and Events, the Anthropology of Revolution. Although all of us know the work of Dr. Armbrust, I need to introduce him. Uh, he's the professor, professor of Modern Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Oxford's Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and a fellow of St. Anthony's College. He's an anthropologist whose research focuses on mass media, popular culture, and politics with a specific focus on Egypt. Recent publications include Martyrs and Tricksters, an, an ethnography of the Egyptian Revolution that was published in, 12, in 2019, and um, Mandering Through the Magazine, Print Cultures and Reading Practices in Interwar Egypt that was published in Middle Eastern Journal uh, Culture of Communication and Communication uh, in 2022. Uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction and I want to thank the organizers of the conference again. It's been a wonderful event. Um, so the topic of my paper is the anthropology of revolutions, but there's not a rich tradition of writing about revolution in anthropology. Why? First, because of methodology. Anthropological knowledge comes from long engagement with human sources through field research. And due to the nature of this engagement, anthropologists often focus on the everyday rather than the exceptional, though not necessarily exclusively, and I will say more about that in a moment. A field site in classic ethnography was an easily defined place, such as a village or an apparently coherent social group, such as a tribe, which anthropologists largely invented. Anthropologists no longer take the coherence of such places or groups for granted. So what is the field site in the context of revolution? Active conflict, perhaps, but how does one identify the boundaries between or among the parties to the conflict? Ideological work, but where are the boundaries between ideology and culture? Social movements, but are social movements necessarily revolutionary? There are institutional barriers as well. One of these is ethical review, IRB, institutional review boards in the US. There are various other names for it in other institutions. At Oxford, it's CUREC, the Central, U Central University Research Ethics Committee. Institutions won't just let academics go out into the field conducting university business. And this applies to all fields, but anthropology is predicated on long-term engagement that ethical review boards tend to view with a more critical eye than, for example, sociologists conducting surveys or political scientists doing elite interviews. Researchers also have to conduct risk assessment to do field work. Risk isn't necessarily the same thing as danger. It's also an institutional calculation of the risk of litigation. Aside from these relatively practical matters, conceptual matters are, of course, more important. First, what is meant, what is meant by revolution? It's worth noting that an older sense of the word revolution was cyclical, a sense of revolving, of coming around again. But then from the European Renaissance, roughly the mid-15th century, the word started to be used to denote permanent change rather than cyclical change. The sense of revolution was crystallized in the mid-16th century when Copernicus published On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, which offered an alternative view to the geocentric model of the universe. The Copernican Revolution signified revolution as a complete, permanent change of order. It permanently changed perceptions of how the universe worked. Once revolution took on its modern meaning of a permanent change in fundamental order, it was applied to politics and society, but also to technology, the scientific revolution or the agricultural revolution, for example. 
Anthropology doesn't have an extensive history of researching revolution in the modern socio-political sense. One reason for this is that anthropology emerged as a discipline devoted to the understanding of societies that were seen as unchanging, supposedly primitive societies. On one hand, this was premised on an assumption of European superiority. On the other hand, the discipline eventually developed conceptual tools to understand primitive people and societies as nonetheless fully human, fully as human as Europeans. Culture was one such concept. Human beings all had a culture, even if cultures were radically different. And to understand cultures that Europeans saw as radically different from themselves, anthropologists elaborated synchronic models of structure and function, which they called structural functionalism at one point, to explain how they thought these apparently timeless societies worked. It took a long time before the need of anthropologists to explain change by historicizing the subjects of their research took over the discipline. And this is a reason that anthropology as a discipline was simply not interested in questions of revolution. Other disciplines, of course, did have more extensive traditions of analyzing revolution as an event that disrupts the social political order. History, political science, and sociology. How do they approach revolution? Very broadly and simplistically, they were looking at different kinds of societies, what were once labeled somewhat condescendingly as complex rather than primitive societies. Anthropologists studied, though historians, uh, rather than the primitive societies that anthropologists studied, though historians and political scientists didn't necessarily view supposedly complex non-European societies in ways that were less Eurocentric than anthropologists saw their primitive societies. For some, a basic differentiation was made between political and social revolution. It was assumed that a political revolution would change state structures without changing the social system in the sense of altering class relations. Social revolution, by contrast, was seen as basic changes in social structure and political structure in a mutually reinforcing fashion, but also in the context of socio-political conflict. For anthropologists who did start thinking about revolution as a phenomenon, and this actually happened quite recently, the language of state structures, political and social revolutions, seemed like a bombardment of unexamined terms used as if they were self-evident. The academic language of revolution used in a not terribly distant past seemed quite at odds to a contemporary anthropological sensibility. Consider, consider Feta Scotchpole, whose book States and Social Revolutions was a classic published in the late 1970s. You can see the quote. Though one of her case studies was China, it is nonetheless an extremely Eurocentric vision of revolution. There are many terms that today we might see as less than straightforward. Class and structure, for example, or state. It's not a given that these are comparable formations across different societies. But perhaps the most problematic word is rapid. What counts as rapid? For a revolution to be a revolution, according to Scotchpole, there must be basic transformations of a society's state and class structures within what time period? A month? A year? Does a decade count as rapid? If a revolution results in a civil war, which is very common, as you can imagine, is the civil war part of the revolution? Her case studies were the French, Bolshevik, and Chinese revolutions, which unfolded over somewhere between four years and a couple of decades, though, of course, the exact time frame was a matter of hot debate. It's worth noting that Scotchpole's book was published in 1979, which was the year of the Iranian revolution. The unexpected and arguably sudden impact of that revolution perhaps influenced the thinking of that generation of scholars. For anthropologists, for anyone to have confidence in the way that Scotchpool and her many followers invoked the term rapid is kind of astonishing. All disciplines are, of course, broadly aware of the time frames that I've just mentioned. And even if there's some dispute over the beginnings and ends of a revolution, Everyone must be aware that rapid is an extremely elastic term. 
Yet, even though there's surely wide acknowledgement of the elasticity of the word rapid in this context, Scotchpool's understanding of what a revolution is remains influential, at least implicitly. Rapid means the fall of the old regime, not the reconstitution of a new regime and a new social structure. But there is potentially a lot of time between one and the other. It's also still implicit that a successful revolution has a revolutionary outcome that bears some resemblance to the goals of the oppositional forces that initiated the revolution. Hence, in the Arab uprisings that began in 2011, Tunisia was, until fairly recently, though not necessarily any longer, considered to have had a successful revolution because there seemed to be a plausible trajectory from oppositional forces to the post-revolutionary regime. Egypt, by contrast, had an unsuccessful revolution because the post-revolutionary regime opposed the aims of those who initiated the uprising. This assumes that Sisi represents a straightforward restoration of the Mubarak regime and the Mubarak system, but that may not be the case. It depends on how one understands the role of the military before and after the revolution. Another way to understand revolution, still in the, non -con in, in the context of non-anthropological approaches to the phenomenon, is not as an outcome, in other words, say, seeing that it's only a real revolution if there's a revolutionary outcome, but as a process. This is the approach of contentious politics, which was made famous by Charles Tilley, Sidney Tarot, and others. This allows one to see a revolutionary process as performative and contingent. In this case, the revolutionary outcome isn't the issue. Rather, it's the circumstances that lead to disruptive political action. It's a revolution when people doing such actions name it as such, and the ruling regime, as long as it's still in power, treats it as such. It doesn't matter whether there's a revolutionary outcome, as Scotchpole defined it or not. The point is the process and not the outcome. Contentious politics is more relatable to anthropology than the structural approach of Scotchpole because of its emphasis on performativity and the contingencies made by social actors with agency. And though contentious politics can draw data from many kinds of sources, it's also not incompatible with a fieldwork-based methodology. However, contentious politics is quite positivist and data-driven rather than interpretive. Data can be quantitative or qualitative, but if it's qualitative, the point is to generate data rather than meaning from the perspective of those involved in revolutionary actions. Anthropologists are also concerned with discerning patterns, so contentious politics is not necessarily completely at odds with it, but contentious politics isn't really an ethnographic approach to revolution either. How do anthropologists approach revolution then? As I've already mentioned, there is no substantial anthropological engagement over the long term with revolutions as such, but in recent years, revolution has been becoming more prominent as a subject of anthropological inquiry. Consider the project of Igor Cherstik, Martin Holbrad, and Nico Tassi, Anthropologies of Revolution. It's the result of a European Research Council five-year grant at UCL. Their work acknowledges that there hadn't really been an anthropology of revolution. However, they suggest that mainstream anthropological themes can be repurposed to productively illuminate revolution. Some of the things they focus on are ritual transformation, which is a classical anthropological theme applicable to a variety of social scales and contexts, the articulation of kinship, localized forms of social organization, and roles of state, party, and political vanguards in revolution, how notions of personhood affect the constitution of revolutionary subjects, the constitution of charismatic leaders, how ideology affects the social construction of illusion and reality in revolutionary contexts, and revolutionary politics understood as a cosmogonic project, as they call it, the genesis of new worlds. This is perhaps a distinction from political science and sociology. New worlds is conceptually ambitious. Political scientists and sociologists tend to focus on certain types of society, 
there is a degree of Eurocentrism inherent in conjuring with such constructs as regime, social class, and the means of production. These can be fairly narrow conceptual straitjackets. On the other hand, a cosmogonic project that anthropologists posit to create new worlds is awfully broad and vague. It gives us conceptual space to consider the impacts of great social upheavals, but it also risks diluting the phenomenon of revolution to the point of irrelevance. Chestick, Holbrad, and Tassie try to stake out a self-consciously anti-normative view of revolutions, assuming that political scientists and sociologists hold the normative positions. The book, of course, asks pointed questions about conventional distinctions between revolution in modern and non-modern societies, essentially whether such a distinction is really even useful. They refuse to state a definition of revolutions, though that, in fact, doesn't set anthropologists apart as much as they claim. Certainly, it's a stark difference from Scotchpole's emphasis on revolutionary outcomes, but neither historians nor sociologists are all dogmatic about the necessity of having a normative definition of revolution. And so I think they're arguing a little bit against the straw man in that respect. Chestick, Holbrad, and Tassie do put the phenomenon of rupture at the center of their anthropological intervention into revolution. Of course, the issue of what exactly is being ruptured is a thorny problem. We can provisionally say a rupture in social or political normality with the caveat that defining what normal means is quite a can of worms and will inevitably raise fierce debates. These are the same debates anthropologists have had for decades over the nature of collective terms that denote collective entities, structure, culture, society, or identity. All of these have been dissected, reformulated, or potentially even abandoned altogether in ways that are designed to accommodate degrees of agency in an effort to allow conceptual space for explaining how change occurs, which not uncoincidentally makes anthropology far more institutionally useful in the world we live in than its dubious roots in the study of primitive society did. But change is not rupture. This is evident in the terms anthropologists adopted as culture substitutes, such as Pierre Bourdieu's habitus, which he defined as structured structures predisposed to function as structuring structures. I memorized that phrase as a graduate student. Structured, that is, by human agents in the first instance, and thereafter acquiring some sort of ongoing momentum, yet not a momentum that can not ever be redirected. Another is the assemblage, as conceived by either philosoph philosophers Deloise and Guattari, and then reformulated by Bruno Latour. An assemblage refers to networks of human and non-human actants, but the network itself is not a thing of sudden change. Another formulation was practice theory, promoted by Sherry Ortner and others, which is a kind of nominalist approach to how patterns emerge from the sum total of what people do. And Ortner's practice theory had a fair amount of resemblance to theories of structuration borrowed from sociology, which is premised on the recognition that social action cannot be fully explained by structure or agency theories alone. All of these formulations are designed to address the perceived shortcomings of culture as a transcendent concept. Transcendent, in other words, meaning something that is believed to be coherent and bounded, yet an immaterial matrix in which we all live, but never actually tangible for any one of us. But still, none of these culture substitutes very easily accommodates rupture as a phenomenon. Of equal importance, however one theorizes whatever passes for normal, whether it's a habitus, an assemblage, practice, or structuration, any anthropological invocation of rupture inevitably must articulate with the social meaning and impact of time. Whatever position this group of anthropologists, Holbrad and Cherstein and, and Tassi, want to stake out for an anthropology of revolution, understanding revolution as a rupture in time is unavoidable and yet difficult to reconcile with the culture substitutes that have become normative in anthropology as a discipline. 
There is, however, also an anthropology of events. Events are socially constructed and don't necessarily have to be understood as ruptures in time. You could say that not every event has to be seen as a rupture, but all ruptures are events. As the introduction by Bruce Kapferer to In the Event, an edited volume on the anthropology of events, explains, social sciences and humanities disciplines tend to approach events in two different ways. First, as exemplifications or illustrations, usually in the form of case studies, or more general ethnographic descriptive or theoretical assertions. And secondly, as happenings or occasions that establish a conundrum that an, an, an ethnography is meant to explain. Most anthropological ethnographies offer examples or variations of the first, events as em exemplifications of patterns though there are a lot of different ways of expressing patterns and fierce disagreements over the significance of how we understand them. There are fewer ethnographies of the second type, the one that focuses on happenings or occasions that can't be reconciled with the known sense of pattern and therefore need to be explained. These are events that shift social patterns, possibly dramatically, though exactly how dramatically is a matter of opinion in specific cases. Many historians are con committed to understanding events as singular happenings, but there are a number of anthropologists whose names come up often as having affinities to events and singularities, or even generative of alterations in larger social patterns. The subtitle of In the Event, which is toward an anthropology of generic moments, doesn't actually mean generic in the sense of a class of things. What they mean is generative, events that generate meaning. They don't take the novelty of meaning created by events for granted, but they're firmly trying to steer away from looking at events as exemplary or illustrative of stable social patterns. They invoke a number of examples of this kind of anthropology. Clifford Geertz's Nagara, the theater state in 19th century Bali, begins with a mass suicide of the Balinese court before Dutch invaders, which he posited, posits as a generative event. Also, the Manchester School of Anthropology, which had Marxism-inflected analyses of non-normative events that potentially changed social structures in African societies, specifically Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, and South Africa. They were interested in atypical events that revealed what ordinary and routine social practices of a repeated, ongoing kind tend to obscure. Kapfer also cites Evans Pritchard in the same vein in his book, The Senussi of Cyrenaica, published in 1949, a book about how the Senussia Sufi order joined with Libyan tribes to resist Italian occupations. And he mentions Marshall Salins's historical metaphors and mythical realities and also islands of history. Salins invented something called the structure of the conjunction. Uh, for example, between native Hawaiian culture and European culture upon the arrival of Captain Cook in 1779. The structure of the conjuncture frames a structural dynamic irreducible to a single cultural or social order, but simultaneously a site of emergence from which novel articulations of practiced reality arise. And then finally, there's Victor Turner's ritual process, a social form for controlling social transitions. The form involves first separation of initians, who are those central to the transition, from normative society. And then secondly, entry into a liminal phase in which unexpected actions can or even must take place, an unpredictable moment that can be conducive to creativity, but also to destruction. And third, reaggregation in a new social state. Turner's ritual process is an extension of Arnold Van Genep's early 20th century writing on rites of passage, but in the 1970s, Turner expanded it into an analysis of transition states that weren't strictly ritual. I'll come back to him because the concept of liminality was important to my revolution book. And so let me recapitulate. First, revolution isn't a particular speciality within anthropology. The phenomenon of revolution is much more conspicuous in social science, in political science, sociology, and history. Revolution is, however, an emerging area of interest for anthropologists. 
to some degree in response to global political events. For us, this invokes the so-called Arab Spring in 2011, the results of which continued to reverberate in the region. But the Arab uprising happened in a larger wave of political unrest in the post-Cold War era, beginning with the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, as it was then called, in 1989, and extending to the Occupy movement that was ongoing at roughly the time of the Arab uprising. If one doesn't insist on defining revolution strictly by the standards of a revolutionary outcome, but instead as a type of contentious politics that seeks to compel change outside the rules of an existing political system, then there may have been many other relevant uprisings. Ukraine in 2004, many other parts of the former Soviet Union, Lebanon in 2005, Iran in 2009. But while few, if any, of these episodes qualify as revolutions by the classical standard of Scotchpole, a revolutionary outcome largely determined by those who initiate political disruption, certain political upheavals nonetheless do stand out the ones that come to be regarded by participants themselves as cosmogonic, world-making, or at least perceived as such by many of those who are involved in them. There can't be a one-size-fits-all standard for a cosmogonic event, but perhaps that's exactly why anthropology should have a place in the scholarship on revolutions. What qualifies as a world-making event is undoubtedly highly subjective and localized, and understanding such localized expressions is meant to be a strength of the discipline. And so I arrive at the Arab revolutions of 2011, or the Arab Spring, if you want to use that term. There was upheaval across the region, but the places that stand out the most in the wave of 2011 were Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen. I'm going to restrict my discussion to Egypt. There is, however, a recorded version of this lecture that discusses Syria as well as Egypt. There is less about Tunisia and Yemen because relatively little anthropological research focuses on them. If you want to listen to the full lecture, including the discussion of Syria, I've put the URL in the PowerPoint slide. It leads to my Dropbox folder. <laughs> the two books that I'm going to talk about are Egypt in the Future Tense by Samuli Shilka and Martyrs and Tricksters, my own book. Along with the URL to the unabridged version of this lecture, I've also put the URL to a recorded lecture that is entirely about my book on the PowerPoint slide. This includes quite a bit of visual material and videos. So first, Samuli Shilka's Egypt in the Future Tense. Earlier, I talked about anthropological approaches to events, two different tendencies which have been around for a long time, certainly since the 1930s, if not earlier. One is exemplifications or illustrations of longstanding patterns, and the other is happenings or occasions that establish a conundrum that ethnography is meant to explain. In other words, events that have potential to act generatively, to change patterns. Egypt in the future tense is of the first type. It isn't meant to be about revolution. Indeed, Shilke is openly skeptical that what happened in Egypt in 2011 and the years afterwards even deserves to be called a revolution. Though he did write about the revolution as such in a blog that recorded his experiences in the first week of the revolution, when he quickly flew to Egypt and experienced the revolution as it unfolded in Cairo. And that's titled, You'll Be Late for the Revolution, an Anthropologist's Diary of the Egyptian Revolution. But the heart of Egypt in the future tense isn't revolution. It's what he calls grand schemes, particularly moral schemes shaped by religious conservatism that had increased over the four decades before he researched the book and was most salient in the lives of his informants who were both Muslim and Christian, and mostly young men in a village called Nazlut Arayas, although I, I think that's probably a fake name, in the northernmost part of the delta, not far from the sea. Religion wasn't the only grand scheme of concern to the book. He also discusses hopes for the future, shaped by economics, neoliberalism, though he doesn't really differentiate it from capitalism in general, 
politics, love, community, and individual aspiration in a peripheral place. And he also discusses certainties promoted by leftist and militarist nationalists during the years of the revolution. It is a book about the revolution in the sense that much of the research was done during the revolutionary times. Not the first few days leading to the fall of the Mubarak regime, but the two and a half years of struggle between the state and the revolution. Schilke puts considerable emphasis on the unintended consequence of events, but also on hopes and frustrations that both predate the revolution and continue on after it. Egypt in the Future Tense is substantially a book about piety, or actually struggles to achieve religious perfection in an inherently imperfect world shot through with contradictions, which his informants live in ways that aren't visibly compatible with religion as a grand scheme. He does deal with the revolution directly in the final chapter. His interlocutors were, on the whole, never overtly interested or involved with politics. They were, however, certainly affected by the revolution, even in, in a quite remote and peripheral village. Schilke goes into some detail about political polarization within the village, and he relates stories about initial enthusiastic attempts to begin creating a new world by cleaning up the village. Other anthropologists told the same story in Cairo, and indeed everyone who was in Egypt experienced it in some way. But the wave of enthusiasm passed. Much of Shilka's chapter chronicles the ultimately doomed efforts of young people to commit themselves to a revolution, but with ambivalent results in much the same way as his many Salafi interlocutors who never managed to live up to the religious perfection they aspired to. Schilke concludes by noting that the self-styled revolutionaries were exactly the same sorts of people who were already attracted to grand schemes before the revolution, the social actors who were most given to engage in constant ethical reflection. Many of them became self-consciously leftist and anti-capitalist, yet Schilke describes the anti-capitalism of the left as often amounting to a strangely capitalist anti-capitalism. Although often anti-capitalist in theory, the revolutionaries actually practice and promote a radical and compelling version of the capitalist revivalist ethos of futurity by singling out the capacity to desire, hope, and demand something more and something else, and claiming that capacity itself is the thing most worth desiring, hoping for, and demanding. The pattern ends up being quite circular, and that fits quite well with the book's basic rejection of the eventfulness of the revolution. And then finally, my book, Martyrs and Tricksters, an Ethnography of the Egyptian Revolution. It's based on living in Egypt in 2011 and 2012. I was there because I had two years of research leave to work on the history of Egyptian mass media. Like Shilke, I wasn't in Egypt to study a revolution, yet I found myself living in the midst of one. Unlike Shilke, I lived very close to the symbolic epicenter of the revolution, downtown Cairo, or actually Abdin. My book was an ethnography of an event, but like many other books, it does make a stab at defining structural conditions that made revolution possible, if by no means inevitable. As anyone who studies revolutions will tell you, revolutions don't happen because people are miserable and downtrodden. There were and are certainly many societies poorer and less prosperous than Egypt that have not had revolutions. But no matter how committed one is to a contingency-centered explanation of revolution, for a revolution to occur, there still has to be a sense of grievance widespread enough to generate a significant desire for dramatic change. Almost all books on the Arab revolutions point to capitalism as a primary factor in generating the grievances that led to revolution, or most often capitalism in its neoliberal form, in which the state actively supports the accumulation of wealth by the already wealthy, and there's a redistribution of wealth upward and an erosion of state support for middle class citizens. This is not to say that being on the wrong side of neoliberalism was necessarily straightforward in material terms. There is grinding poverty in Egypt, but the revolution was in no sense an uprising of the poor. I've been going to Egypt since the mid-1980s. 
of the families that I've known continuously over that time, in some cases over three generations, all of them are better off materially now than they were when I first met them. And some of them were quite poor when I first knew them. I'm not talking about people who already had socioeconomic advantages. None of these families were pro-revolution, though they weren't necessarily pro-regime either. Certainly, of those I know who were in favor of the revolution and even actively involved in it, the social profile was more elite, at least in an intellectual sense, but largely in an economic sense too. Capitalism in its neoliberal form doesn't necessarily produce extreme poverty, but it does structure desires that can't be fulfilled for many. I found the concept of precarity quite useful. It doesn't mean literally precarious in an economic sense. The concept can apply to all sorts of people in the economic middle stratum who feel less, who, who feel less insecure, who, who, feel, who feel less secure and have to run harder and faster to acquire credentials and experience that made them feel they were still in the game, socially speaking, and to cross a threshold that would make them worthy of full protection by the state. It was a threshold that was impossible to define concretely, but actually the fuzziness of the threshold is precisely what made it so effective in making people feel that they had to keep striving for security. You never know when you've crossed the line, and so you always keep running. Neoliberalism was also impossible to ignore in its capacity to remake the urban space that people lived in. Space became more hierarchical, more commercialized, and more securitized. You could say that the two faces of neoliberalism in Egypt were the luxury housing compound and the police van, and the latter fell very harshly on young males, some of whom were drawn into the more violent phases of the revolution, not at all by ideological means initially, though some did become intellectually drawn to the revolution, but for quite a few, the experience of violence was essentially carnivalesque. This is not to discount the real and sometimes shocking violence that was inflicted on them by the security forces. The point is that fighting with the security forces could never be solely reduced to ideological commitment, but had to also be understood in the context of evening the score in a semi-ritualized and in some sense even fun violence in retaliation for years of police abuse that often targeted young men of a certain economic profile. When I was talking about Simuli Shilka's book, I invoked different anthropological stances towards events. Egypt in the future tense framed events as exemplifications of longstanding patterns. Martyrs and tricksters takes the opposite approach. Events are potentially generative. They can establish new patterns, though so, through self-conscious world-creating projects. However, I agree with Samuli 100% that the consequences of events understood this way can be unpredictable. Certainly, nobody can claim that the January 25th revolution even remotely resulted in the world-creating project that those who initiated it envisioned. No doubt you're all familiar with the mythical status of Tahrir Square in the Egyptian revolution, and you probably know that what happened there was replicated to varying degrees throughout the country, even as far as Nazla Torayas, the remote village that Shilke lived in. What happened fit the basic form of something anthropologists have called the ritual process. I mentioned it a few minutes ago in the context of talking about the book on the anthropology of events. The idea was patterned on rites of passage, which Arnold van Genap wrote about in the early 20th century. Initiands in a rite of passage are separated from society. They go through a limen or a liminal phase in which they inhabit social roles that are counterstructural and in varying ways often unacceptable or reversed from normative social roles. The moment of entry into this liminal phase tends to be euphoric. Victor Turner, who amplified and elaborated Van Genep's ideas in the 1960s and 70s, called it communitas, a time out of time, in which everyone who experienced the ritual was bonded together. In a standard ritual, initiands were then re-aggregated into society, but in a transformed social state that was nonetheless part of normative society. It was hard for me not to think about the ritual process when processing the experience and aftermath of the early 
days of the revolution, when the myth of Tahrir Square became the symbolic lodestone of the revolution. The revolution happened in January. By roughly April, I was thinking someone must have written about the ritual process in political terms. Although a few historians and sociologists had, what they'd written really wasn't terribly interesting and was long out of intellectual fashion. Then, out of the blue, I was asked to review a manuscript by Bjorn Thomason for a journal. A version of that article appears in the book on the PowerPoint slide. Thomason's article reinterprets a number of classic anthropological and sociological concepts for the purpose of understanding political phenomena. He's an anthropologist, but he's not very good at writing ethnography. He's more like a continental philosopher or intellectual historian and also a political theorist. The most important of the classic works that Thomason reinterpreted for, the value, for their value in understanding politics had to do with liminality articulated by Van Genep and later Turner, hence the title of his book. What he was doing was very much in line with Cherstick, Holbrad, and Tassi uh, with their project that they were recommending in the book on anthropologies of revolution. But they're quite wary of him. I mean, they're, they're quite wary of Turner. And this is because Turner, in particular, who's most associated with the idea of the ritual process, is considered to be a rather conservative figure. His ritual process was interpreted not as a way of understanding how social patterns can enter into novel configurations, in other words, how things change, but as an explanation of why things stay the same. The ritual process was seen as a way to reaffirm social structure. It's taught in anthropology departments largely as an element of outmoded, an outmoded type of British structural functionalism. You can see this in many anthropological works. In fact, Schilke brings it up in the conclusion to e Egypt in the Future Tense. Oops. It's not the right one. Oh. Ah, sorry, my slides are out of order. Um, this is a common way of understanding term Turner. You, I, I won't read the, the entire passage to you. You can see it on the PowerPoint slide. Um, it's by no means universal in the discipline. You can look also at the Bruce Kapfer essay from In the Event. He has a much more positive appraisal of the potential significance of the ritual process. Thomason argues that the in interpretation of Turner that Schilke is giving here is a flat out misreading of Turner's work, particularly his later work when he'd broken decisively with structural functionalism and begun engaging with phenomenology. I'm getting close to the end. The gener generative potential of liminality was actually of much greater interest to Turner than social stability. Thomason insists that liminality is defined not by ritual, but is rather marked by it. Ritual is about transition. All transitions require at least a moment of in-betweenness. Often the state of in-betweenness is a moment of danger because one or more or thousands or millions of social actors have left a state of normativity, and in that moment, they can do the unexpected, and the unexpected can be dangerous. Think of a handshake, which is a minute ritual. You do it when you meet a stranger. You leave your personal space, and the person you are meeting leaves his or her personal space, and you do the unthinkable. You touch a stranger's hand. But you can't go through life without having a convention to meet people that you haven't met before. And so the handshake becomes a ritual that marks such meetings. You get used to doing it the same way every time. In fact, if someone sticks out a hand and you refuse to shake it, you make an enemy. And so almost always, you go through with it. Ritual exists to control that moment of liminal uncertainty and potential danger. You press the stranger's palm, and the stranger knows that you're not going to smack him or her across the face. And so ritual is, in fact, a conservative social act. We often derisively dismiss something that has become ritualized for precisely that reason. Thomason's insight was that ritual marks an, marks an expected transition and neutralizes it, but not all transitions can be anticipated. 
In politics, this is particularly important in great events of turmoil, such as revolutions. A revolution is a massive transition that has no ritualized or conventionalized outcome. Hence, when it happens, people enter into a liminal state, which is initially a euphoric bonding experience, as everybody who um, experienced Tahrir Square knows, or communitas. But when there's no consensual way out of it, euphoria turns into a sense of unease and eventually panic. When that happens, the initial experience of everyone joining together in a state of communitas gives way to taking sides. If you reread Schilke's chapter on the fizzling tensions and eventual subsidence of the revolution in Nazla Torayas, it makes perfect sense as a realistic reading of the potential of events or transitions to initiate changes, but not necessarily on a particular outcome. And I agree with him 100% that the consequences of such events are unpredictable and can be disastrous. Okay, now I need to actually go back, right? Yes, because my slides were out of order. There are normally unpredictable, there, there, are, there, there, there are other normally unpredictable phenomena that can be important in moments of liminal crises, such as political tricksters. The trickster is a universal figure They've existed throughout history in mythology, religion, and literature, and they've probably existed since mankind became mankind. They're agents of both creation and destruction, and they are who they are by virtue of being semi-outsiders who are good at imitating and capable of making people believe they can do stuff they actually don't know how to do. Hermes, Loki, Br'er Rabbit, Coyote, Juha, Sindbad, Bart Simpson, and Saul Goodman. All of them are tricksters. Normally, they exist at the social margins as both the subject of stories and tellers of tales. One of the other contributions of Bjorn Thomason was that he flagged tricksters as political figures in certain circumstances, particularly circumstances of liminal crisis. So possibly, you can add to the list of tricksters Hitler, Mussolini, Donald Trump, and, in my opinion, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, at least in his initial rise to power. One of the chapters in my book explores the significance of a trickster in the Egyptian revolution, Taufi Okasha, a bombastic loser in normal times who became a kind of carnival barker for the military during the revolution and played a role in preparing the public for the coup. Again, if you want to get more of a taste of what Okasha was like, read the book or listen to the lecture. Um, I put the URL on the PowerPoint slide again. Or just think about Donald Trump. <laughs> In the end, I'm not exactly pro-revolution. Or you could say that I'm ambivalent. I admire revolutionaries. I admire their bravery and their idealism. But I think almost all revolutions, in fact, end up producing consequences that have little to do with the initial aims of those who want them to happen. Revolutions are liminal crises, and as such, an environment in which tricksters can move in from the social margins and achieve actual powers. I know that Thomason feels the same way from having talked to him at a conference, and clearly the dangers of unexpected consequences were prominent in Schilke's thinking as well, even if he explicitly rejected the position of events as potentially generative rather than as instantiations of pattern. And so my position, which I don't necessarily see as contradictory to Schilke's, is that to understand the revolution in Egypt as a generative event doesn't actually require one to subscribe to the ideological aim of the revolutionaries. In Egypt, the consequence of the revolution was ultimately to transition from what political scientists call upgraded authoritarianism under Mubarak to militaristic nationalism under Sisi. This was not at all what the leftists, liberal or Islamist activists marching to Tahrir Square chanting Silmiya, peaceful, envisioned. The ends of the revolution were certainly unintended, but I think it's wrong to say that as an event, the revolution wasn't generative. Political scientists, by the way, have a pretty extensive literature on what they call transitology. That's largely how they understand the Arab revolutions that resulted in the fall of regimes. 
In other words, for them, the revolution ended with the fall of the Mubarak regime, or the Ben Ali regime in the case of Tunisia. For me, the revolution lasted all the way to the coup in 2013. In contrast, for many political scientists, after the very quick fall of the ruling regime, writing on the two revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia tended to be structured around democratic transition, which was considered to be successful in the Tunisian case, although it might not be any longer, and unsuccessful for Egypt, and never begun in Syria since the regime never fell. But political scientists tended to look for transition predominantly in institutions. For anthropologists, the revolution was really about what happened after the fall of the old regimes, and institutional transition was never their primary focus. I think anthropologists had fairly good tools for understanding the important process of how revolutions were decided outside institutional frameworks. And of course, I hope that such tools are of interest to those researching and writing on political culture. And that's the end. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor, Ar Professor Armbrust. Um, I'll start, uh, OK? <laughs> I didn't even finish my sentence, but go ahead. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ernesto Spindola. I'm a PhD candidate um, at the University of Essex, candidate in government. Thank you, Professor Armbrust, for uh, such a fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I guess my question would be, um, can you further reflect, I'm really interested in your opinion, can you further reflect on, because I, I know you've already mentioned this throughout your presentation, but if you had to, and of course these are ideal types, but if you have to reflect on whether a revolution is a ritual that repeats more of something or either transforms Irrespective of your answer, could you further um, elaborate on, on why you think that it is either a repetitive ritual or a transformative ritual? Thank you. Should we take several questions, or should I answer them yes. one by one? Uh, I was looking at the social media questions. By the way, if we have questions in Arabic, should I give them to you in Arabic or translate them immediately? I don't know. If I don't understand them, I'll ask you. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's really an interesting uh, and very uh, rich uh, lecture. I have uh, three comments. Um, your attempt to remap uh, anthropology via the lens of this event that you call revolutions is really interesting, uh, the way you uh, hunt and, um, you know, fine-tuning the anthropological uh, tools and all this. But in my opinion, this is only the quarter of the story. Because there is a, a whole a tradition that is not present in uh, uh, this remapping, especially uh, cases such as Palestine, such as uh, the Sandinista in Nicaragua and the work of Ted Gordon. Of course, in Palestine, it started with the first Intifada with Ted Swedenberg and others, and Julie Petit work, and uh, also you have the Basque region and the Irish case. It seems to me that you take uh, the position of the Kumaros. You, you, you look at, and you have your gaze, and you look uh, at it in a very, uh, to me, it's institutional. Uh, you keep anthropology as if anthropology engagement with the revolution domesticates, theoretically, the revolution uh, uh, by trying to fit it into different concepts that anthropology um, has a long uh, history of grappling with these terms and a lot of tensions, a lot of tensions. The uh, second comment is as follows. More and more scholars what, you, uh, what we in anthropology used to call natives, are, are trespassing the lines. More and more people, uh, which is, I see it as a very positive phenomenon, 
uh, are starting their ethnography and then moving from being an ethnographer into being an activist and a revolutionary or mixing both. And we have so many examples of these. And the question is um, as follows. If you are an ethnographer and you are producing this specific type of knowledge, uh, and in the end you said that um, you are not very optimistic or kind of uh, uh, you are with the revolutionaries and you describe them as uh, brave and courageous and this. But these real living individuals are suffering and they are struggling. Yani, uh, um, it seemed to me paternalistic to a degree to say that I respect their courage. I produce knowledge about them. And this has a long legacy in anthropology. This is uh, a serious divide in anthropology between people who decide to make coalitions with the revolutionaries and people who decide to make or produce knowledge about them. Now, I did ethnography in Palestine during the Second Intifada. And I couldn't produce knowledge in the, or the, the form of knowledge that you are describing. It was something different. Now, the last thing that I want uh, uh, to point to is that anthropology itself went through several revolutions. There are many shifts inside the discipline. And the question, if you uh, will make parallel between events in anthropology and events in, let's uh, call it, uh, the, uh, the field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for uh, this very fascinating presentation. For someone who is far off being uh, an anthropologist, I have learned a lot. I just uh, want to, uh, I have a question, in fact, about uh, the use of the term revolution. You started by saying that there is a lot of debate what the revolution really uh, means. Uh, but as someone who is working like a political scientist, I was bit surprised that you avoided to use the term uh, social movement. Is that, is that, uh, ha, uh, uh, have you done this purposely? Because today, most political scientists not you, will not use the term revolution because it's very normative. Uh, what about a social movement? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Walter, for such a fascinating and overarching talk. Uh, I want to ask about, I'm here. Hi. Oh, OK, I couldn't uh, find you there. <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask about the liminality, the liminal phase, which seems to be uh, the central uh, concept in your book and in your talk today. Uh, and I, I, I wonder how you would respond to someone or to a critic that says, uh, liminality doesn't tell us that much about revolution. It's just one more word for uh, this contention process. So, uh, and it seems that, uh, I think I'm underestimating, but uh, it, we can use this uh, liminal phase or liminality, uh, we can apply it on revolutions. But what does it tell us about uh, re revolutions? Uh, for example, you, you've talked about that uh, you, ha you have uh, um, uh, something to say about Syria, um, maybe Yemen, and uh, Tunisia. So how this liminal phase vary across uh, these cases? Uh, or it's just a uh, euphoric uh, case that doesn't vary that, that much? And the last point is, when does the liminal phase end? You said that revolution ended uh, uh, with uh, the overthrow in, in Egypt. Did the liminal phase end before that? And what does that mean for the revolution to succeed? Thanks so much. I think we'll take the four questions for now, and then we'll have another round after your answers. So, so I should yeah. talk now? So, yeah, okay. the. OK, first of all, um, further reflect on whether a revolution is a, is a ritual that repeats something or transforms something. Why is it either repetitive or transformative? 
it's an opportunity for transformation. I mean, once the social order is broken, then things can happen that couldn't normally have happened in normative social order. But it's not necessarily predetermined that what happens will change everything. I mean, in a really big transition, such as Egypt, in a really big uh, sort of, sort of rupture in the social order, such as happened in Egypt in 2011, happens. Um, I mean, where I, different, where I differ with Simuli Shilka is that he th essentially argues that things return back to sort of normal, only a bit worse. Whereas I think that there is actually, there actually was a revolutionary outcome. It just wasn't the outcome that the people who began the revolution intended. It was, it, it was a, a national, nationalistic, um, militaristic government headed by Sisi, which I think actually is not the same as the, as the authoritarianism of the previous social order. Um, and Ismail Nashif's comments, um, I agree with some of what you're saying, that there is a, a long um, tradition in anthropology of writing about societies that are living in violent conditions. Um, and I would acknowledge this. I, I agree with you. I mean, I didn't mention it here, but uh, you know, I have mentioned it in other accounts of the revolution. I mean, this is a large part of anthropology. And I agree also that a large part of anthropology um, engages with activism and that the disciplinary ethics actually encourage anthropologists to take the part of their um, informants uh, or their interloc interlocutors. And if I were to do that in the case of Egypt, I would, of course, side with the revolution. But I don't agree with you in um, the sense that, that there's anything particularly pat patrimonial or patronizing about saying that this revolution resulted in, un in unexpected outcomes. And I did actually witness a number of non-Egyptian, um, non non-Arab scholars you know, continue to cling to this idea that the revolution continues, um, you know, even after the coup. And that actually disturbed me more. Um, uh, you know, that I, I think that the revolution did end, you know, and, and, and that, I think, does make it different than a, a place like Palestine or El Salvador or Ethiopia, um, places where anthropologists actually have been engaged on the ground in doing research in very violent conditions. Um, I, I think that you know that the institutional realities also uh, have to be taken into consideration. There would have been no chance of getting a grant to study the revolution in Egypt for an anthropologist. I guess political scientists did because uh, you know people have written about the phenomenon of revolution tourists going to Egypt. Um, who you know didn't know the language had never been there before, but you know oh my gosh there's this exciting thing happening we have to go write about it and in some cases they um, you know kind of exploited local universities to you know hire interpretive interpreters and fixers to take them around to see those sorts of events um, and and I don't see myself as having done that I mean I have been engaged in going to Egypt since the early 1980s. And you know, I wasn't expecting to write a book about a revolution, but I don't think I was a tourist either. Um, but I, but I, I, I take your points, and I, I agree with them um, to some extent, except in, in the case that to say that um, I admire what happened in Egypt um, I don't see. I, I, I'm more disturbed by saying, you know, insisting that the revolution continues when, in fact, it doesn't. Um, you know, it, it really did end in Egypt, and people are dealing with all kinds of bitter realities in the aftermath of it. Um, and I'm totally sympathetic with them, but I think that it actually disrespects them to just continue saying the revolution continues, which is what people were saying as as it started to go bad. I mean, all through the first two years of the revolution, every time there was a reversal, and there were many, then people would end their commentary on it by saying, the revolution continues. Um, and it did, but only up to the coup. And my comment, if I'm allowed, was not about ending or not ending or it ends. It's about, uh, uh, you said you don't want, uh, you described the revolutionaries as courageous and brave. Uh, 
let's say my sensibilities in Arabic it come across as paternalistic. I am not, uh, uh, maybe in English it, it does not come across as such. Okay, I, I mean, we can talk about that later. Um, and then you said a couple of other things. Um, I, well, I guess I've, I've already mentioned that more scholars, you said more scholars are trespassing the line um, uh, state uh, of, of, of eth between doing ethnography and activism. Um, and, and I agree, I mean, that should be acknowledged. Um, and for the most part, I mean, I wouldn't say that I am a, you know, dedicated to activism, but I participate in many of the events that activists participate in, and I, I, I sympathize with them more than with others. Um, I'm not sure what you were referring to when you said anthropology itself went through several revolutions, which, I mean, which, you know, like the reflexive turn, or I mean, what, what revolutions did you mean? Uh, there are many shifts. Yeah, I use the term revolution just to make some uh, kind of uh, reflective uh, exercise between the reality outside the discipline and what is going on in the discipline itself. And if we can make uh, this, use these tools of event and pattern inside anthropological thinking itself. Because usually they call, call it the turn or they try to uh, mitigate its effects. But take, for example, in the case of Egypt with uh, Hassan Fahim and all the case about uh, the uh, debate about uh, Aswan's Dam and how different reorganizations uh, and different intellectual legacies came into being between native anthropology and uh, Western anthropology and all this, which is usually does not come across, in, uh, at least in the graduate studies in anthropology. They term them as terms, which is, uh, to me, mitigates the, uh, let's say, the heuristic or the uh, hermeneutics aspects of these uh, events. Okay. Um, there was another comment about uh, so a political scientist now avoiding the term revolution and being much more interested in social movements. Um, well, that may be true, but Egypt was still crawling with political scientists during the revolution, <laughs> um, and and there 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 were there were actually books written about the revolution from a from a social movement perspective, um, and so and and also there is a very extensive um, tradition of writing about social movements in anthropology. Um, most of the people who were writing about social movements um, didn't necessarily try to write books about the revolution, but they were producing um, sort of commentary that was linked to the revolution. Um, and liminality, there was a comment that said, liminality doesn't tell us much about revolution. Is there something to say about places such as Syria and Yemen? When does the liminal phase end? Um, liminality is a form. But what happens during the forum has to be understood through local context. And so all it really is is a breach in the social order. It begins with what Turner described as communitas. But when you have an ongoing case of liminality, then you get the coup in Egypt or you get the war in Syria. Um, people do take sides, and actually the potential for violence increases. Um, I think political scientists have ways of dealing with breaches and normative orders as well. Um, I think the anthropological approach to it is probably a bit broader and less focused on institutions. But, um, you know, the, to, say, to say, what does liminality tell us about revolution? I mean, you have to actually understand that in a case-by-case -case sense. It tells you something different in Syria than it tells you in Egypt. But in both cases, recognizing what you know, sort of the stages that people go through um, gives you a starting point, at least. 
but the actual meaning of events and the and the unfolding of subsequent events, of course, differs from one place to another. Thank you. I'll take five. I can only take five because uh, we're running out of time. Maybe five minutes for questions, five minutes for answers. We'll end okay. it there. No, so I'll start with Save the Ambassador. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Saif al Islam, and I work in the Arab Center. And uh, thank you so much for the for the interesting uh, lecture. And uh, as we had some talk yesterday about your works uh, uh, on uh, on the Egyptian Revolution, I found like many writings are very interesting. And uh, I have a comment about the approach uh, you used in in the beginning of the lecture about the Egyptian Revolution, which is uh, you you are presenting the. Um, uh, um, you know the capitalism uh, versus the the neo uh, capitalism uh, uh, policies, which had been like driven by Mubarak regime, and this is you know what ma what made people erupt in in the first place. And my comment here is, um, didn't you, didn't you think that it's uh, somehow political uh, that the, the people were like erupting and they, they flooded the street on January twenty fifth or January twenty eighth, exactly when they tried to to attack the sample of the uh, the sample of the regime, the police stations. They didn't go to the central bank. They, they didn't go to uh, you know some some minist ministries uh, of uh, of commerce or or economy or something like that, but. Uh, um, did, didn't you think that it, uh, the, the approach has to be political uh, and uh, something related to the, uh, the structure of the regime itself? Uh, for example, the, the Mubarak regime held uh, the, uh, the, parliamentary the parliamentary elections uh, like just one month or two months before the, uh, the revolution, and the people, like you know, found it all fake, 100% fake, and it, it, it all went to uh, his, uh, his national party, the, uh, the, the National Party of Egypt. And this is, this is my first comment. The second one is about the, um, the, the term you use, the communities. Um, don't you think also that we can use something else uh, um, can describe more the uh, the status of the people in the Maidan and, and Tahrir Square than which is collective restraint action uh, and uh, it it was uh, like described in, in a paper uh, by Dr Adam Sauli and he described the the, the people uh, in Tahrir Square then how did they you know held together uh, um, between like among among the different components, Muslim Brotherhood, the liberals, and the, the, the other seculars, and also the ordinary people who, who didn't have any political orientation then. And the, the last thing here is a question uh, for you, like uh, how did the, uh, the, like you wasn't, you wasn't the streets in, in 2011 and 2012, and you told me yesterday about how did you see everything by your, your own eyes? How did this affect you after that? Like, uh, did, it, did it change your uh, your mind on on uh, things related to the revolutions in the Arab world? Thank, Thank you so much. Walter, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, talk. I'm going to go get the book and read it. Uh, I take your talk as a fresh corrective to uh, a lot of analysis of how the revolution continues in different parts of the Arab world. But I want to take you to Lebanon, because myself, there are others in this room, lived through the 2019 protest day by day, as citizens, as scholars, and so on. And I know, I know you're going to hate me for this, but as political scientists, <laughs> What, what, what lessons can we learn from this, this uh, moment of liminality about political organizing? And I'm sure you experienced this in Egypt because this, these kind of pattern of leaderless, uh, non-hierarchical uh, uh, movements or groups and so on were all over the Arab world. And uh, liminality at one point was romanticized. But you're making a very powerful argument that the revolution ended, and it ended uh, with the, the kind of results that uh, those who were in it did not want. But I, I want to learn, I want, to, I want you to say something about what, what lessons about political organizing can we learn from, from these experiences. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Walter, for uh, your amazing talk. Um, uh, well, I mean, me as a as a consumer of anthropological work on on revolution or about Arab uprising, if you like, I mean, the beauty of many many work uh, uh, where I like is uh, uh, is really this uh, uh, modesty. Uh, uh, of this, uh, of how they start, they don't start from uh, from theories. They didn't start from social movement, Abdel Karim uh, uh, theory, for instance. And uh, w where this is a mistake of many sociologists that they try to uh, to take um, uh, a model, uh, a model and uh, uh, a theoretical model and applicate it. So, uh, so on, uh, anthropology. I mean, they. Uh, uh, they cons they considered I mean what I I learned as a moment of learning uh, 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 revolutions as uh, they didn't uh, uh, it, it come to surprise everyone including all the intellectuals so uh, so it's a moment of learning no need to say we uh, we expected we uh, it's a, it fit, fit a model etc so this is this if you like my under understanding of how contribution of sociology. Uh, of uh, anthropology. However, uh, I will follow up with the Basil uh, point that, in fact, your I didn't read your book, but but you, the way you summarize it, left much more questions than answer uh, about, uh, for instance, leadership uh, 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 nature of it. I mean, uh, if you, if you take. Uh, 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 the important thesis of Azmi Bshara in, in his book uh, on, on Tunisia revolution about elite. I mean, that uh, whether the elite, they talk to each other or not. I mean, the trickers, I mean, is it substitute the elite in, in your study? Can you t say a little bit more of, the, uh, if you like, the moving from uh, 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 analyzing uh, liminality to, uh, to some uh, uh, concrete object? Yes, um, thank you very much indeed for your exquisite clarity of presentation, um, particularly of the various uh, analytical and interpretive templates that might be, that one might probe in order to come to a certain understanding of the processes that you have been dealing with. Uh, now, my question um, pertains to uh, these analytical templates. It's, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not meant to provoke you. Um, I mean, I do believe. I do believe uh, that. Uh, uh, I don't think. I don't think. I have no impression that you were in any way patronizing. I think many Arabs as well were uh, uh, impressed and sympathetic, uh, but not party, right? And in, in a very much the same situation as you found yourself in. And my question, of course, it's it's prompted by curiosity and a certain sense of incongruity. And I assure you, it's by no means woke. I'm very, very far away from anything which might remotely approach anything which is woke. Now, my question is this. Um, why have you confined yourself to Anglophone scholarship? I mean, surely um, Arabic scholarship has been, uh, there has been an explosion of Arabic scholarship on this particular revolution. Uh, some of it rubbish, some of it ex exquisitely, exclusive, uh, ex uh, exquisitely uh, suggestive value which has been completely absent from your consideration of the various ways of dealing with this. I would say also the same for French scholarship. So why the self-confinement to a set of templates which are not, which, which first of all need, which need to justify their relevance given that they are only one component in a much larger package of interpretive Possibilities. Sorry, I'm taking uh, questions by order. That's why I haven't reached you. I don't know if you have time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Walter, for your uh, very interesting um, uh, lecture and talk. Um, I, I found the use uh, of the concept liminality is very unpersuasive for the following reason. Um, in, in rites of passage, that was, you know, described and, and labeled by, by Turner and then w was applied by other scholars in understanding 
uh, carnivals and other rites of passages, uh, for example, in Brazil and other uh, uh, countries. The, the, the idea of this liminality phase is actually designed by the society, where in, in the in rite of passages, or rite of passage, people, the society has designed this process where they, they actually uh, go into this phase, but then later on, they uh, exit this process in the other side to the very same society and very same social order. Whereas in revolution, the idea of the revolution that you are actually trying try to, to apply this uh, concept of liminality is actually comes to break the social order, to offer an alternative social order. Th th that's why people in, in the Tahrir Square were actually calling uh, It's not going back to the same social order. For that reason, I think the application or applying this concept of liminality to understand the, the, the revolution in Egypt and other uh, Arab countries is not very persuasive to me. Thank you. Okay, um, let me attempt to address at least some of these questions. <laughs> In five minutes, I don't know. <laughs> We've lost the copyright anyway. Uh, yes, um, so there was the question, the first question um, was about structural factors, neoliberalism. This was from, yeah, from SAFE. Um, and you're saying, isn't there something more linked to the regime itself rather than being explained through, you know, kind of structural, stru factors structured by neoliberalism? I'm not sure I fully understood the question, um, but certainly people were reacting to the political manifestations of the regime. But I think most of the interpretations of neoliberalism suggest that the, the, the kind of security apparatus and the politics of the regime were part of the neoliberal order, not separate from it. Um, although I'm not entirely sure I understood what you're asking, but perhaps you can um, elaborate later on. Uh, uh, communitas, isn't there another term that can be used to describe the people in the square? How do people hold together all the various factions bonding together? Um, let me in, instead, you know, sort of address that there were several questions. That, that several several questions that were were expressing skepticism about the utility of liminality. Um, uh, well, the, I mean, the easiest one to address is is the last one. Um, I'm I'm not um, approaching liminality through the conventional anthropological reading of Turner, which is that uh, precisely what you said. I mean, you basically just reproduced the, the standard line um, used in anthropology to dismiss Turner and liminality. Um, but for me, the crucial lens through which I'm seeing liminality is the work of Bjorn Thomason, not the standard anthropological interpretation of, um, uh, of, um, of Victor Turner. Um, and, and Thomason actually argues that Turner was more interested in change than he was in things staying the same. I and mean, he's been interpreted in anthropology as, um, as, as essentially providing an explanation for why things stay the same, as being a sort of very, very, but there are lots of, he himself plus other people who have um, sort of adapted his insights actually were, were precisely interested in how things changed and the potentials for change occurring through these periods of rupture with the normative social order. And what I was saying in the, in the lecture is that yes, indeed, ritual is a conservative social form for transitions that are known and expected, absolutely. Um, and, you know, absolutely the point is to re-aggregate people safely back into the same unchanged social order. The problem is transitions that don't have a ritualized or conventionalized exit or re-aggregation. And that is the insight that Bjorn Thomason gave us about the uses of liminality in politics in revolutionary situations and also the, the emergence of figures that people begin to listen to who they wouldn't have listened to 
uh, you know, within normal social order, but suddenly when the normal social order is at least temporarily, well, temporarily, but nobody knows exactly when it's going to be reconstituted. There was another question about when liminality ends. Um, and I mean, all I can say is it's over, you know, you know when it's over. I mean, in, in the case of Egypt, it was over with the coup that put an end to the liminal phase. Up until the coup, I think the revolution was, in fact, still ongoing, and there was still something to fight for, and people were still fighting for it. Um, but once the coup happened, that was the end. Um, and actually, what a different way of explaining how the liminality, the phase of liminality, when it, when it is in this protracted situation where there's no conventional means for ending it, is through schism, some, another anthropological term, um, which is schismogenesis. In other words, a new order is created that is, in fact, quite different and was unthinkable during the old order. That's actually another one of the kind of classic sociological theories that Thomason reinvents in his writings about political theory, um, schismogenesis, which I think you could argue is what ended the period of liminality in Egypt was the establishment of an, of an order that was in fact different than the social order that existed before. Why confine myself to Anglophone scholarship? Um, I'll try to do better is all I can say. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't read French. I do read Arabic. Um, and you know, I would be very grateful to um, you know, to know about, you know, particularly anthropological writings about revolution in Arabic. And, you know, if I, if I know about them, then I certainly will incorporate them. Um, are we out of time or is it I, I think we'll uh, end here because you have two minutes to have your coffee before the next session. All right, yeah. Anything else you'd like to say? No, I want um, coffee. Apologies for those. I, <laughs> no. I haven't been. Thank you. Has been very stimulating.